Thanks everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, hopefully the rain will hold off. Uh, join Northeast Ohio Burp photographer Roger Friedman as he takes you on a captivating journey from a novice bird watcher with limited photography knowledge to a skilled artist who captures breathtaking bird photos. In this engaging lecture tailored for bird and photography enthusiasts of, of all levels, Roger will share his personal story of passion, learning, and artistic growth and allow you to discover the secrets behind transforming simple bird phot photographs into works of art. With stunning examples and valuable insights, Roger's presentation will increase your awareness as to what it takes to make a bird photograph unique and inspire you to elevate your own bird photography to new heights. Roger Friedman, a passionate nature and wildlife photographer, embarked several years ago on a never-ending quest for the perfect bird pho photograph. Beginning as a hobby capturing birds in his backyard, Roger's dedication and pursuit of perfection have, have earn, earned him the admiration and respect of both photographers and bird enthusiasts alike. Fascinated by the ordinary and driven to make it extraordinary, Roger finds joy in ph photographing local birds, seeking to illuminate their inherent beauty. Whether it's a familiar cardinal perch nearby or a stunning black Bernian on its migratory journey, he skillfully captures the essence of each bird, showcasing their unique personalities and behaviors. Through his bird photography, Roger strives to engage viewers, inviting them into a world where, where feathered subjects come to life, sharing glimpses of their captivating allure. The byproduct of precision and patience, Roger's photographs reflect his remarkable artistry and unwavering passion for bird photography. <laughs> Let me put my computer up here first. I don't know, after an introduction like that, I'm just, uh, you wrote, you read every word I wrote very nicely, though, that was good. <laughs> All right, so, well, thank you very much for that, and, you know, I think it was uh, Gina who first contacted me to, um, to do this, and, you know, you mentioned that you wanted a world-class photographer to lecture to this program. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it, so... I'm here instead. But don't worry, because, you know, I've given plenty of lectures before. Of course, they've all been about podiatry. So hopefully I haven't mixed up some of those slides here. That would be pretty awkward. Uh, I'll tell you that right now. So I'm hoping to at least inspire you. I, I know there's some very talented photographers in this room already. Maybe you'll pick up a, a thing or two, and then there are people who've never picked up a camera. Maybe this will inspire you to pick up a camera. I know uh, that... Uh, seeing a scarlet tanager like this uh, sparked me to, uh, to really get into this. So why do I do it? It's pure enjoyment. I love it. It's fun. Um, the excitement of seeing something new. I love that with a zoom lens, I can just look in and see the incredible detail of these birds. It's just amazing. And then with high speed shutter speeds, I can stop them and freeze them and, and see the incredible behaviors of them. So. Uh, and of course, the social interaction and meeting new people, everything, it's great, and sharing photos. I started very simply. About seven years ago, I had this little Lumix point-and-shoot, um, and, I, you know, I was just playing around with it. I took it in the backyard, took a few shots. Uh, I couldn't even believe all the birds that were in my own backyard. This was in suburbia, and I, uh, I didn't even know what kind of birds they were at the time. But, of course, when I saw this cedar waxwing, the activity of it, and the beauty of it just, uh, it just took me so much. So I said, okay, I, I think I may try this out. So I bought a little more expensive camera, I don't know, two, $300 for this um, Lumix camera. And I set up a feeder in the backyard and I just started taking photographs of the birds at the feeder. And I was really, really having fun with it. So then I decided to branch out. And so I went to Sandy Ridge. This is my first award-winning photograph. I give myself my own awards. It works out very well that way. And uh, so this is the first one that I, I got an award for. And the reason I, I like this was because it had good lighting, a nice pose, the subject was isolated, and more importantly, it was in focus, because most of the photographs I was taking was not in focus. So being in focus was a big plus. So 
then I started getting motivated and I, I wanted to get a shot of, you know, an eagle carrying a fish or an osprey diving or a hummingbird at a flower. Or I wanted to be, I, I'd see some great photographs from some of the people in here even uh, posted and I say, oh, I want to get a photograph like that. So I got inspired to, to try to emulate that and, um, you know, I was celebrating certain things like, oh good, I got another shot in focus, so just kept going. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to talk too much about camera gear here. But um, because it's really only one part of the equation. I mean, you can really get an outstanding photograph with any camera. Uh, so it's, it's what you're doing behind the lens that, that makes the difference. So I tell people who are just starting out, you know, get the best you can afford and, uh, you know, work from there. Uh, and then for people who've been at it for quite a while, instead of focusing on that next new greatest piece of gear, focus on some new technique or something that you can do that's, can improve your, your photography. I will say that when I moved up from my that Lumix camera, I uh, went to a Sony bridge camera, and I think for anyone starting out, and for birders, these are pretty much your, your go-to cameras. They're, they're lightweight, they're easy to carry around, they have a nice zoom range, and I'll tell you, they give some pretty darn good photographs if you uh, work, work with them. Um, of course, the disadvantages, though, they have this small sensor, so you're not going to get the detail that you want um, or may want, and um, the, the focusing can be slower, um, and birds in flight can be tougher, things like that. So it, it became time for me to upgrade to a, a, a larger camera. I felt I was somewhat limited, and I wanted those sharper, more detailed images. And seeing somebody like, like Greg out there photographing, I had LLE. That's long lens envy. <laughs> so this was one of my first mentors. This guy, Robert, he lives in Tennessee. I wanted to be exactly like this guy. Well, maybe without that long white beard. But um, he, I'd never met him, never met him in person. But we conversed over uh, Flickr, which is a photo sharing uh, uh, site. And I loved his photographs. He inspired me. He, um, he told me to get the Sony camera to start out with, and one day he posted this photograph, and I jokingly commented, hey, that one on the left looks perfect. I think, I think I could handle that. Well, here's this guy from Tennessee I've never met. He packs that camera up, sends it to me, FedEx. I mean, yeah, I'd never met the guy. He says, try it out, see how you like it, you know, and you'll buy it from me if you like it. So I go, wow, this is, this is pretty amazing. So. Anyway, I take the camera out, and I'm trying it, and you know, it's totally different than anything I'd ever used. And fortunately, he'd kind of set it up for me, so I knew a little bit how to use it. But I just, I felt awkward with it, and I don't know if I could justify it. And I said, nah, you know what, I, I'm, I'm shipping it back. So I packed it all back up with all the styrofoam and taped it up and wrote him a nice note. That lasted about two hours. <laughs> then I opened it back up and said, yeah, I got I to gotta try this out. So I went out to Huntington Reservation. And I was overlooking Porter Creek, and there was this nice uh, kind of dead tree that was hanging out over there. And I'm standing there and just kind of got the camera ready. All of a sudden, there was a splash in Porter Creek. And I look and see, and there's like some activity coming up, so I'm getting the camera ready. And I, there's like this blur coming up from, from the creek, and I could hardly see what's going on, but I'm shooting away at it as quick as I can. And here, right in front of me, is this beautiful barred owl with this fish. And I mean, this photo is uncropped, so I mean, this is how close it was to me. And, you know, it's got this fish that's doing, a, it's a Billy Bass imitation. You ever seen those fish on the going, don't worry, be happy, well, it's the, and I'm just freaking out and going, this is amazing. So I, uh, I decided to keep the camera. <laughs> and I, I said, you know, the expense, in a year from now, I won't miss that money, but the shots that I may have missed, the experiences I may have missed, priceless. And of course, a shot like that, you have to be in the right place at the right time with a camera. I mean, I didn't really even know how to use that camera well, so so much of it has to do with, with being in the right spot, but um, now that I know how to use it, I know how to at least miss those shots if I don't. But So anyway, I turned into my friend there finally without the white beard. Uh, I'm not going to talk much about camera settings because there's so many great YouTube tutorials and videos and this guy Steve Perry, if you don't know him, check him out because he's, uh, he's got the best stuff on the internet. Of course, I do shoot in manual mode. I use auto ISO. 
People may like to shoot in what's called JPEG instead of RAW. I learned early on that JPEG lets the camera decide how it's going to process the shot. And I want to process it myself because the, the taking the photograph is only half of it. Processing it is really another half of, of getting the, the, the shot the, into a work of art. But uh, these are just some basic things about using the shutter speed, you know, and, and making sure that the shutter speed's fast enough to capture birds in motion and things like that. So I, when they're perched, I can go to lower shutter speed. When they're moving, of course, I have to bump it up. And then when they're in flight, uh, that's the BIF, birds in flight, I have to really sometimes go up to, uh, you know, as high as I can get. These are my three P's of success, and I pretty much apply this to everything, not just photography, uh, patience, perseverance, and passion. And I think if you have those three, you'll be successful in photography as well as other things. I really want to tell a story when I take a photograph. It used to be I just, would, oh, I got a bird and a photograph, isn't this great? Then it's sort of in focus, not anymore. Now I just, I really want to tell a story, capture that bird's behavior, tell, get some personality about that bird, something about that bird, have it speak to the viewer. And so that's what I what I do, and, and also take, make the ordinary look extraordinary. So if it could be a house finch, I don't care. I want it to look the best possible light. Um, this is a kind of a nice concept that I heard about, and these are three things that can help guide you when you're thinking about how you want your photograph, how do you want to approach taking a photograph, the angle, background, and composition. Talking about the angle, I want to get at eye level if I can, because that's going to engage the viewer enough um, um, as most as I can. It's going to put you in the bird's world as much as possible. Um, sometimes it's not possible to get eye level, so if you get as close as you can, you just you don't want to be up like this. That's not going to get a great shot. If you're down like this, it can sometimes work, but uh, eye level is going to be best. Um, then, of course, where's the angle of the sun? I always like to try to have the sun at my back because it's going to illuminate the bird as much as possible. But side light can be really nice, and even backlight can be, can be good. But when the sun gets too much overhead, it's going to get harsh and shadows, and it's just, I mean, yeah, you'll get a, a dock shot, but you're not going to get a, a work of art. So, and then the angle of the bird. Is its head tilted? Is it turned over its shoulder? Is it looking over its back? These are all things that can really help make an artistic shot um, and then the angle of how it is on the perch. And now that's not all, always uh, set in stone because I can, in post-processing, tilt that or rotate that a little bit. And I will do that to make this shot a little more artistic. Just if the perch is going like this, I may tilt it a little bit and it puts the bird on an angle and it just looks more pleasing to the eye. So how low can you go? I mean, I can get pretty low when I need to take a shot. It's the getting back up that's tough. <laughs> So um, nowadays what I do is I carry this with me in my car. So if I need to get a, a low shot, I use something like this. But there's, for birds that are down either in the water or on the ground, getting low is just great. Um, also, the cameras nowadays have flip screens. So for this shot, oh, and by the way, I, I'm putting like what camera I used and then the date I took it and where I took it and some of the settings for some of the people who are interested in that type of stuff. So it's on some of these photographs anyway. Um, I think I put the camera right down on the beach for this shot, and uh, it, it just allows the bird to be isolated, gives a nice clean background, and um, makes for a very artistic shot. This snow bunting that was out at the Lorraine Fishing Pier a couple of years ago, I know, Greg, you were out there too shooting these. Um, I laid down right, and I took out of Greg's playbook. I laid right down on the uh, ground and, and took these shots to get that beautiful blue uh, sky, blue water in the background. Because I'll show you, there's some shots taken from standing up. I mean, it, maybe that's okay to put on eBird or something that, that you saw it there, but that's not, uh, I'm not going to put that on my wall. But here's something that's artistic, and that's, so that's what I'm going for, is to get that low angle shot. Uh, these are some juvenile harlequins that were out at Rocky River uh, Park. You know, here I am standing up getting my dock shot, but here I am getting down right on the beach, right, you know, put the viewer in their world. This is what you want to do. This is the artistic shot that really uh, uh, reaches out to the viewer. Um, here's another shot where I was laying down on the beach to get this. If I were standing up, it just would not have been as dramatic at all as this shot. It really puts the viewer in the action. Now, sometimes you don't have to get down too low. You, the bird can come up a little bit. 
And uh, so this bird, the uh, dark-eyed junco here in my backyard stood up, and it was kind of on a little bit of a hill, and there was a little bit of a drop-off behind it, so it, it, it gave a little bit of a clearer background, so, so that worked out well for me. Uh, for this one, I think I went down on one knee to get this yellow-headed blackbird. It was also up on a hill, so that made a, a nice background. You want to get that blurred background if you can. You, want, you don't want the background to distract. I mean, even a cardinal here, just in the grass, just getting down low. I think I used the uh, flip-up screen, got down low enough to, uh, to put me in the, uh, the, the view of the bird. S sitting on the side of a bank, uh, getting pretty low, so this northern pintail showed up. Uh, I, this just shot would not have been the same if I had taken it standing up. It, the, the perspective is so much different. And then shots like this, I mean, I love it when I can get something where you get drama. Here the, the head feathers are nicely illuminated. You've got these water droplets coming down. The sun, of course, was back here and shining, and uh, I got some really nice backlight on this early morning. Early morning light is key. And this shot, if I had not been down low, would have looked totally different. So, And this, uh, the pair of them crossed in front of each other. And this, Clay Park is interesting because it's not that big of a, of a lake area. And, um, but mergansers hate people. And I mean, these hooded mergansers, I could never get close to them. So what I would do is I would camp out on one side, and then there were dog walkers and people walking around and let them then drive the, the ducks towards me. And uh, so that worked out pretty well to get closer shots. And now this dark background is by using the higher shutter speed and uh, using this uh, minus uh, exposure compensation. Things like that can help to uh, make a shot a little more artistic. Uh, another backlit shot, Sandy Ridge. Uh, once again, getting that dark Black, back, black background really helps this uh, uh, egret stand out. Um, this, I, you don't even need the details of this greater blue hair, and you know what it is by the silhouette. And so taking a silhouette shot can sometimes be a, an artistic uh, way. Here we have a nice sunset in the background. Uh, sunrise at Sandy Ridge. I, I just love going out early morning, you know, late afternoon. That's when the light's the best. This um, uh, mallard was a, a little above eye level which uh, gave a nice clean background and uh, the light in back of it. This uh, red breasted merganser, it, it, I wasn't down very low for this shot, but it stood up for me and it was kind of riding a wave, so it, it, uh, it kind of worked for me because there was a drop off behind it, gave enough uh, clean um, lines behind it so that it stood out. Let's talk about head angle a little bit. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this Kentucky warbler, I hope it comes back. This is a, this month, a couple of years ago, and um, but it did a nice little turn across the body, and that uh, just kind of gives a nice pose. This over-the-shoulder look of this American goldfinch is a, a nice look. For woodpeckers, I prefer to have them looking away from the trunk of the tree. It tends to isolate them more. It's just more of a dramatic of a shot. Um, here, up, oh, this was at winter. And uh, this is actually snow that the, some sun was uh, shining on to give that. And then this uh, was the woods illuminated in the background. It's just early morning light once again for these. Um, this uh, was in the woods, so there, wasn't, uh, there was just some filtered light coming in. But this is a nice over-the-shoulder look. So what I, I mean, I just shoot away and shoot away and shoot away. And I just look for those shots where I've got some kind of a pose or something that's going to be engaging. I mean, here this bird is, is looking right at the viewer, and that just helps to engage uh, the viewer. Cardinals are great because they uh, look so nice when they have their crest standing up, uh, and you get these nice angles and these nice lines. And this one has a nice clear background, and then this one is, we call it the frame within the frame, when it's, it's kind of framed by the uh, thorny bushes there. Um, this uh, one thing you'll see about a lot of my photographs is I like to use the corners of uh, to angle things towards the corner. So here I've got the tail angled this way, I've got the beak kind of angled down this way, I've got the crest angled up towards this corner, and um, this is a setup shot uh, done in my backyard, and we're going to talk about those in a little bit too. But I love doing those, and uh, uh, can be really great to get some great shots. The background, we kind of talked a little bit about that with the either blurred or colorful. 
just don't want it to compete too much with the bird because uh, it can distract it, but it can help tell the story if you've got some interesting uh, uh, environment in the shot. I think the key to an artistic shot is the composition. That's where the story is really told. Um, and I already talked about how I point things towards the corners um, and leaving space is really important too. Uh, this symmetry in, in a shot like this, if I divide this into a grid, you'll see that the tree takes up one third, the body of the bird takes up a third, and then there's space for the third. And then the eye is just centrally located. And I just, I like that type of symmetry. It just, it, it makes for a nice composition. We've got some snow going in the background. I love taking photos in the snow. I love taking photos in the rain. Anything to add to the environment um, is, is good. Uh, here's a you know beautiful blue-winged warbler. Uh, it's it's got a little bit of leaves coming in here, and I like that. That's okay. It's because the eye and the beak are totally uh, uh, visible and in focus. And then this frame within a free frame, where we've got some of these uh, branches here framing the bird, so it makes for a, a nice composition. Uh, Savannah sparrow, same type of thing with the frame within the frame. This diagonal. Uh, shape of the branches and the, the, the beautiful over the shoulder, uh, over the back look, uh, really makes the bird stand out. So these are things I look for. You know, I, I could have taken a shot with this and, and not had this and it would not have been artistic, but because of that frame within the frame and then the, the angle of the head really made this shot. So this is the rule of thirds. Sometimes I follow it, sometimes I don't. It just depends. But this is, they did a study and they said that these intersection points are important and that this is where your eye tends to hit. So when I'll take a shot sometimes, I put the interesting activity in that area. So here this great cat bird with this uh, berry. Uh, if you look at the, the grid, the interesting activity is occurring right in that spot. And once again, I've got this angled up towards that corner, the tail towards that corner, and the branch coming angling from corner to corner. Uh, another shot with the rule of thirds where this, um, the eye right, is right over the intersection. Uh, I like the way this branch is shaped. It kind of follows the contour of the body and uh, it has some environment in there, makes for a nice artistic shot. Uh, another rule of thirds shot out at Margaret Peak. I could have centered this, put the owl in the center, but instead I just, it's looking somewhere. So I gave it a little bit of space to look into and uh, put it in there. But sometimes you want it centered. And so when I have a bird like this uh, red-bellied woodpecker that just came popping up out of the snow looking straight at me, well, I want to center that. So this is a nice use of just centering the shot. This also was done in, uh, this was at, uh, yeah, Honey T uh, Rocky River Reservation. This is um, uh, eagle flying out and once again, it's coming right at me, so I want to have that centered. I want that to be coming right uh, into my view. Uh, when I have a bird perched on top of something that's centered, I'd like to center it. I've got the eye centered. I've got it centered in there. I think this just works, having, having it uh, centered when it's on a tall uh, perch like this, the eastern bluebird. But sometimes we have to move our position, and so uh, sometimes we don't have time to do that, but here this uh, red-tailed hawk was eating some prey and it was busy and I knew I could kind of move around, so I took a couple shots. You know, I always take a safety shot to make sure that I've got a shot of, of it. And then I moved 90, I just didn't like the way that there was, this was all kind of blown out here. It's not pretty, there's no really colors here. It, it just didn't make much sense to me for, for an artistic shot. So I moved 90 degrees from the light uh, to have the light coming on the side, it was better. It was, at least there was some light coming here, but I still didn't like, I didn't like these sticks in the way and I didn't, I just didn't like the background much. So I moved another 90 degrees and there I get much better lighting on the bird. I get some blue sky in the background. Uh, it's a little busy for me, but it's still, it's, it's uh, much better. So sometimes it's good for us to just not have lead feet. We've got to move around to try to get the best shot. Here's, this just happened the other day, 
And if I'm driving and I see an interesting situation, I will pull over and I will take a shot. And so this um, red-shouldered hawk was perched on this uh, billboard advertisement for an industrial building. And I thought, oh, that's kind of unusual. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a shot of that. But the lighting was horrendous. So I said, well, let's see, where's the sun coming from? Ah, I moved about 25 feet over to my left, and there, there's the shot that I ended up with. And that's, you know, that tells a little bit of a story. It's an interesting, it's unusual. It's not your usual type of shot, so um, that's what I look for. Um, I want to tell a story, so I'm looking for interesting in, uh, actions, interactions, scenery that's unusual, lighting conditions that are dramatic, things like that. So uh, you can have the same, you know, two of the same species, uh, the male and female, kind of tell a little story. And so it's kind of a fun little shot of the two of them kind of looking at me like, you know, what are you looking at? And so um, the, the taking the, getting the male and female can be fun. Uh, here, uh, getting, here's, I've got the largest woodpecker, this Peleated, and the smallest, a downy on the same tree. And the, you know, the Peleated's kind of saying, hey, here buddy, here's how, here, here's how you do it. And so these can be interesting interactions. Or you can get the same uh, species here, male and female, a downy, uh, trying to get on the same perch. And so uh, you can get interesting, always looking for interesting interactions. This, I was really surprised when I saw this. I was, I was looking out my window and I saw this red-tailed hawk up there and this house finch. And they were, and I, I, I can't believe this. Well, with the zoom lens, it makes it look closer than they were. They were probably about two feet away. But still, I mean, you can think of a lot of funny captions for a photo like this. So um, always, always be on the lookout. You just never know when you might find something interesting. So, of course, I look, I go to all the metro parks, I look on eBird, there's some random spots that you just never know where you might find them, I'll talk about that. Knowing what the bird needs, you know, their food, shelter, water, that types of things, but knowing the behavior is really important because it helps not only capture those interesting interactions, but helps to bring out the bird's personality when you can capture that. And of course, learning their calls, so you hear something go, ah, oh, there's a kingfisher over there, I want to go get that shot. So. Uh, these are mistakes that I still make, um, running it after the bird because you know you just have to wait for the bird to come to you. I found that especially with a lot of the warblers, they kind of do a cycle, circle of feeding, and they'll come back. They'll come back. You know, there's sometimes when you do have to kind of chase them, but sudden movements, no good. You know, a lot of times I'll be, I'll go, oh, there's a, you know, and I'll move my lens up, and of course, as soon as I move my lens up, they fly away. So slow movements slow walking. I call it my walk like a deer where I'm in the woods and I just kind of take a few steps and then look around. So, and keeping my distance. That's, you know, I've got the long lens. I take a few shots, then move in a little bit, take a few more shots, move in a little closer, keep going. You don't want to be the person who's in with a group of people who makes the bird fly away. That's, you know. So, this is not a photo of me, but that's almost what I looked like when I did this. I spent a couple of weeks couple of hours a day just watching belted kingfishers. You know, belted kingfishers do not like photographers at all. It's kind of written in their DNA or something. And so I made a point that I'm going to learn how to get some really close up and some dramatic shots of belted kingfishers. And I also, there was a certain shot I had in mind that I really wanted to get. So I, I, I decided to spend quite a bit of time and I watched them. I watched them fly and I watched where they perched, how they fished, how far away from their perch would they dive in, where they would take their prey, everything. So I was able to really understand their behavior. Now they catch the fish, they take it, they beat it on the perch for a while, uh, tenderize it, whatever. Then they um, flip it so that they can swallow it head first. So by knowing all this behavior, I can be ready and I can capture that. I know their perches, so I can be just camped out and let the bird land on the perch and be ready to get it. Or when it's coming in for a landing, be ready for it. So you know, just spending so much time with them learning all of this, this bird came so close to me, I almost couldn't focus on it. Um, I was just sitting there, and it, I knew that it liked that perch over there, and it just came and landed right there. And uh, fortunately, I was kind of somewhat secluded and, and hidden so that I, could, I didn't scare it away. Uh, but they're creatures of habit, and they will use the same perches. They will use the same dives. They will, they will do all kinds of things. Now this, 
I was going for a shot. I wanted a kingfisher coming out of the water with a fish, and I wanted it in focus. I ended up with 150 shots of this. And then I finally, I got one shot of it coming out of the water with the fish, completely out of focus. Then uh, I got one of it in focus, coming out of the water, no fish. So it took me about two weeks to finally get the shot I was going after of the kingfisher coming out of the water with the fish in its, and even a couple of us flying away with the water, water droplets coming out of the fish's mouth here. So, I mean, it took a long time to get this shot, those shots, but I learned so much about kingfishers and about patience and perseverance and, and, and <clears throat> excuse me, all of that. So, um, this is an interesting story because you never know where you're going to find interesting birds. I was in the parking lot of J.C. Penney, and um, there are a bunch of trees in the parking lot, and I saw some bird activity there, and it was in the trees and on the ground and the trees, and I look, I look, I look, and I go, oh, yeah, it looks like a flock of robins or something, probably just a flock of robins, so but I said, I'm going to take a little closer look. A flock of cedar waxwings. They were going crazy on this tree. They didn't care I was there. They were probably drunk on these fermented berries. And here I get this nice J.C. Penney building with its muted colors in the background. And I mean, they're just having a field day with this. These are the best shots of cedar waxwings I've ever gotten. And they were gotten in the parking lot of J.C. Penney. And I mean, so good thing I had my camera with me. So I learned carry a camera, whatever, you know, a backup camera, something, try to have, because you just never know when the uh, opportunity might arise. Uh, preening is always a good time to take photographs because birds are busy, they don't care about you, so you can take a bunch of preening shots uh, and get some interesting captures, like with this ruby crown kinglet getting the, the crown kind of uh, elevated there. Um, this northern harrier, beautiful early morning shot. I mean, uh, shot. You can look at the sunlight just gl gleaming in the eye there. Uh, it's preening its feathers, uh, so I was able to get this shot. Um, I watched as ruby uh, uh, throated hummingbird uh, preened, and it would always just do this kind of a tail fan, uh, fan. So I could I could kind of wait and be ready for that. You know, understanding their behavior, knowing their behavior. Ducks, when they bathe, they kind of go in and out of the water, in and out of the water, and they bathe, and then they get up and they do a wing flap towards the end. So you can always kind of be ready for when you see them dunking down and dunking down, there's going to be a wing flap coming up. Uh, this is a really easy shot. Anybody in this room could get this shot. Just go out somewhere where there's some cattails. Right now, we've got the red and blackbirds. They're all trying to show their territory. They go, ah, you know, do that big thing like that. And you just stay there. You get in this shot where you've got like a clear background behind it, get set up, and then wait for them. They're going to keep doing it, you know, for quite a while. And then uh, you get this type of a behavioral shot. Um, wind direction is always important to, to uh, know about because birds like to take off and land against the wind. So I like to put the wind at my back. This uh, is out at the Lorraine Fishing Pier this uh, last year. And um, I, so I was ready when this uh, osprey came in with this uh, nice, nice fish. Uh, here, this shot, well, I'm minus a hat after this shot. But uh, anyway, no, the, having the wind at, at my back and knowing you know, where it would take off and come directly uh, towards me. So um, these are, you know, knowing that. Now knowing when they're gonna take off also is, because takeoff shots can be interesting. So a bird, they're gonna do a feather stretch. They're going to um, fan, fan out these tail feathers uh, like this merlin. They'll shake, they'll stretch their feathers and just do a, a feather shake and you'll, you'll go, okay, they're getting ready to fly pretty soon. Um, they look around, you know, head might be bopping, tail whacking. Uh, obviously when they poop, you know they're about to take off. The other thing is, now this, I was, I was out at Kopf and this beautiful red-tailed hawk, nice juvenile, was perched on this snowy branch. I'm, I'm just taking some really nice shots. And then a dog walker comes by, hey, you getting anything good up there? You know. <laughs> There goes the bird. So, you know, but actually it worked to my advantage because I was ready and I got a nice little takeoff shot from that. But yeah, dog walkers, joggers, they're always, they can certainly do that. Um, so then uh, taking the, the shot, even after they've taken off, some of the, the early flight shots are always fun to get, this great horned owl. Early morning light makes, uh, makes for a pretty shot. 
I've uh, watched a lot of Peleated, especially the past year or so. And um, I've watched that sometimes they'll do this little tilt down when they're getting ready to take off. And because of knowing when they're going to take off, I've been able to get a lot of Peleated shots. These are dramatic shots. I love these. They're not easy to get, but watching when they're going to take off and knowing um, allows me to, uh, to get these, these flight shots like this. And so, um, uh, you know, the understanding their behavior. Uh, but the number one way to know when the bird is getting ready to take off, as soon as my lens gets too heavy and my arms go down, it's gone. <laughs> or when I go to check my phone for text or something, oh, it took off, so. Um, brown creepers will only go up the tree. Not like a nuthatch that goes up and comes down. They'll only go up. So knowing that, these are fast, fast birds. And they're tough to capture like this. So I'm, I'm tracking it, following, following, following. Knowing it's going up and it stops and then fire away and get a couple of shots. And then if you're really lucky, it stops and it decides to go to the next tree. And I don't think you're going to see too many flight shots of brown creepers. But uh, this one was, was lucky because, I, as I say, I was ready. I was tracking it. I knew its behavior. I knew it could only go up. And then it was going to go somewhere, so I was able to get this, uh, this shot. Um, this was a really fun shot. Actually, not this one, but the one after it. But this uh, red-headed woodpecker was grabbing acorns uh, from this oak tree. And it would put it here, and then it would fly, and then go hide them somewhere for the winter or whatever. So I was watching this behavior over and over. It kept doing the same thing over and over. And so by doing that, I was ready to get this shot of it flying down with the acorn in its beak. And uh, this, this tells a story. This is the type of shot that, that I want to go for. Um, courting behavior is always fun. I try to keep things PG when I take my shots uh, of that. But, um, but yeah, these, uh, these types of shots you can get with uh, a lot of the different species. Uh, singing is always a great behavior to capture. And once again, here's early morning. I mean, this is just after sunrise, uh, this song sparrow singing his heart out. And um, that's a great behavior to capture. Uh, nest building is another behavior to capture. Uh, and if you can see a bird that's in the process of doing that, you can, that tells a story. Or, or carrying nesting material around. Uh, like this uh, eastern bluebird, uh, or this osprey carrying some nesting material. And once again, if you see, I'm using these corners again, where I've got the, this angle towards one corner, the wing towards another corner. I like to use those corners. Uh, light is our best friend. I mean, the light makes such a difference in the photograph. It can, you could take the same photograph in terrible light, and it's not going to be artistic, but if you take it in beautiful light, it, it makes the whole difference. So here's a, like an American black duck. This is at sunrise practically out of Sandy Ridge. And I just love the lighting of this shot. And once again, I'm using those corners. I've got the wing up towards angled here. I've got the beak angled here. The head's angled here. And the tails are angled there. So I'm using all the corners. And I just like that type of a, a composition with this uh, and the beautiful background. Um, I mean, look at the sunlight reflecting on these eyes. I mean, that just tells you a story. If this was done in midday, it would not tell the same story. So the lighting makes is key here. This is at sunrise. Uh, this is called a split lighting, where half of the bird is in light and half the bird is in dark, and it uh, makes for a dramatic effect and takes the uh, an ordinary makes it extraordinary. This is a filtered midday light. It's sometimes kind of like a Rembrandt lighting where part shadows and then part light and the muted colors in the background, filtered light coming through the, the woods. So even though this was kind of uh, in the day when after the sun had gotten up a little higher because it was in the woods, you can, you can make that work. Uh, sometimes you need very bright light because you need fast shutter speeds to get these ducks that are moving very quickly. Now this and if you know Sandy Ridge, you know there's one part of the trail that's over here, and then there's another part that intersects this way. Well, the ducks were all congregating in this part of the trail um, in the marsh, and they were kind of feeding. And then when someone would walk down, they would fly about 50 feet out, and then they would slowly work their way back. So I would position myself on this side, and i just wait for somebody to walk by, 
catch them in flight like that. So I, because they're not easy shots to get. So this way, at least preparing myself, knowing the behavior, getting ready can, can uh, help to get shots like this. This, uh, another example of using bright light midday because they're moving at a high rate of speed. Unfortunately, we're probably not gonna be able to get these kind of shots anymore because uh, Miller Road Park no longer has the power plant. So we're not gonna get the open water. I mean, but this was like having the, the being in the Arctic tundra or something and getting a shot like this. It was great. Uh, now, this shot was taken in winter, and I don't mind going out in midday during winter because the sun is lower, so I'm not going to get that harsh lighting. Um, you know, in summer months, I'm pretty much done photographing by 10, 10 in the morning, and I won't go back out until after 4 because the light is just it's too harsh. But in winter, you can get away with it. And, and sometimes you need that bright light, as I say, getting, getting the action, the high shutter speed. And I don't mind cutting off the wings because I want to capture the intensity of that eagle. That's what I'm going after. I want to, those talons and I want the action that's going on. That's what I'm focusing on. So I don't need those big wings to, uh, to dis distract from it uh, unless I'm capturing something like this where I do want to show the, uh, the entire picture. So. Uh, you know, knowing when to crop in and when to not, and, and uh, using the light. Uh, this was, I learned, don't throw away photographs because you just never know what you might have captured. I was shooting this red-winged blackbird here, and I saw something kind of fly up, and I, I didn't quite know what it was, but then when I got home, I saw this photograph, and I went, wow, that's really interesting. I've got a northern flicker up there. What can I do with that, though? I mean, it's way up there, this photo, am I going to throw it away? These cameras nowadays have such high resolution that you can crop in and create. This is an award-winning photo. I gave myself an award for this one. Um, so it's, uh, you just never know when, when you're going to have something that's, uh, that's going to be make something from nothing. Uh, this shot, you know, this is, this is a, a documentation shot only. It's terrible. The lighting's terrible. I mean, yeah, you've got a black pound night here and there, but it's, it's just a horrendous shot. So I moved a, a little further away, and it actually it flew to a different area, and I was able to get lower down and get to where there was some nice light, some nice reflect, reflections, some nice activity. This is a totally different shot. Same bird. It's a totally different shot, and uh, this, is, this is what I go for. Um, getting reflections is always a nice thing, so you know, if you've got some nice calm waters or even if it has some ripples in it, if you can get some nice reflections, that can, can make a shot artistic. This, I love it when I run into these types of shots because I didn't have to do anything. This hermit thrush just jumped up on this incredibly beautiful stump here. I couldn't make anything as nice as this. And the, the light was in back of it with the beautiful uh, colors there, and it gave me a nice over-the-shoulder look. So I'll, I just had to push a button and get this shot. This is, a, this is an artistic shot that I didn't have to do much with. This shot, I, I almost didn't take it because, you know, I go, ah, oh, you know, I wish, I wish this sandhill crane would come out in the open. Why is it back behind? Why is it there? Well, actually, it kind of adds some mysteriousness to the photo, and it, it does, it makes it artistic, so I kind of liked it, and it, it, it worked out pretty well. This shot would be totally different if this uh, great horned owlet was out in the open, but peeking out like this just gives you some drama, some mystery, and, and really makes for an interesting uh, and captivating shot. Now, I'm going to talk about the use of setups a little bit. Setups, I just want to let you know, Everybody uses setups. National Geographic, BBC, uh, any of the great, some of these great photographs that you see in magazines, they're done by setups. So I love setups because one thing about setups is they help me practice to hone my skills so that I can learn what focus mode works best, what uh, everything I need to do. There's no time constraints. I can do it in my own backyard, and uh, I can get really creative and have a lot of fun with it. So this is what my backyard looks like in, in summer. I've got my hummingbird feeder set up here. I've got a little fountain that plugs in. Uh, I've got the canna lily, um, the agastache, the kufia, and the lobelia, the cardinal flower. And then I just sit down in my patio chair and have fun because the hummingbirds love these plants. Yeah, sure, they'll go to the feeder a little bit, but they'll spend most of their time going to all of these various plants that I have. And so I can, if I can encourage you to do one thing, 
hummingbird shots are not easy to get. So to practice, 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 just set up things in your backyard where you can uh, practice getting these shots. You know, here I've got the little fountain going in the background there, and um, this one coming right down at you, so uh, an agastache, and the canna lily. Um, I even went to the grocery store, they were selling uh, gladiolas, and I just, I bought a gladiolus and I just uh, zip tied it to the, uh, uh, yeah, to the arm there where the, the hummingbird feeder was hanging and it landed on it. And so I got this shot. But the canna lily was really special. And I'll tell you why. One day I was out there watering the plants and I finished watering, sat down, got the camera and the canna lily plant has this kind of a broad leaf to it. And some water had collected on that broad leaf. All of a sudden, a hummingbird came and started bathing in the water that it collected in the canna lily leaf. I mean, this was totally unexpected. This juvenile, ruby-throated hummingbird having the time of its life in this little puddle that I had created, and just, you know, rolling around, rolling around, rolling around, and I'm having a great time rolling around. And then when it finished, we both kind of went, ah, that was really nice. And uh, this is another award-winning shot. Uh, so you never know what can happen, so working with setups is great. Uh, this is, I'm lucky I have some woods in the back, and uh, so I set up my feeders with some perches up on the top. Sometimes I'll use natural perches, sometimes I'll buy little things to put up there. But here, you just never know what you're going to get, because they're going to be fighting over the perch, uh, so you get these interactions. Here, I just took this stick, it was an interesting looking stick, I stuck it in the ground, and here this beautiful eastern uh, bluebird came and just landed on top of the stick, you know, going, are the mealworms ready yet? You know, so, um, and then the uh, downy woodpecker came and landed on it too and said, well, I'm going to go for the suet feeder, if you don't mind. Um, this, I, I bought some stuff at Michael's. You know, you can buy stuff. So sometimes I use fake stuff, sometimes I use real stuff, uh, sometimes a mixture of the two. And um, he gets this very, very creative and interesting setups. Here, <laughs> the female just landed right on the top of this little uh, thing that I got from Michael's. I mean, it was just, you just, it's close enough to the feeder, they're going to land on it and wait. You can make your own greeting cards. Uh, I had these little setups where they just landed on it, the dark eyed junco and the tufted titmouse. But here I used real uh, greenery, I put it on there, and it rained, so we got some freezing rain on it, and it just made for such a dramatic, beautiful shot with this uh, black-capped chickadee, and then the, the uh, bluebird landed on it as well. Um, and then I had another little perch that the freezing rain froze on, and this American goldfinch landed on it. I mean, this is just a, a, a beautiful, beautiful shot of a, you take a common bird and make it an uncommon photograph. I then was, I was driving by a golf course and they had cut down a tree and they had a bunch of these tree stumps there and I, I pulled over and I said, could I have one of those? He goes, oh, take as many as you want. So I took a cut little tree stump, put it down near the 10 feet from the feeder and here this Carolina wren gave me a nice little pose so that I could get a shot of it. Then in the winter months, uh, the dark eyed junco lands on it. Um, I even had a hairy woodpecker come up on the side of it once and then land on the top of it and uh, give me this nice little pose. So it's kind of a, it's kind of man-made, but it's kind of natural. So it's, it's, it's just a nice, and these setups are great to do. Um, another setup using a birch branch and some natural berries and greenery. Uh, this one was, uh, I took, I found a bunch of pine cones by a pine tree, collected them, hot glued them to some uh, little sticks and took a little bit of other greenery, put it down, and I had like two levels, and the black-capped chickadee landed on the lower level, and then a junco landed on the top level, and all this snow came down onto the chickadee, and so I was able to capture this nice little shot uh, like that. Um, but natural is always best, but it gives you great practice, because here this, I was out in the woods with this downy woodpecker, and it was on a natural, uh, uh, snag there and it uh, kind of went rat-a-tat and made the snow come off and it, it made for a nice shot. I'm going to talk about a Norway spruce. I planted about five Norway spruces in my backyard and I cannot tell you the number of birds that love that Norway spruce. There's, they feed on it. Uh, this uh, gold crown kinglet was feeding, finding some kind of bugs in it. The, the white-breasted nuthatch landed on it before going to the feeder. Um, so it makes just a beautiful, beautiful uh, place to get. I mean, even the hummingbird landed on top of the Norway spruce. Um, so that's, if you can put a Norway spruce somewhere, 
it's great. Here in the winter, I've got the downy woodpecker on the Norway spruce. Um, the bluebird would love landing on the Norway spruce. I mean, and this, these type of compositions, I mean, uh, are just gorgeous. I love having these with the nice lighting on it and the background uncluttered. You know, I was fortunate to get a few warblers coming through. A Cape May landed on the Norway spruce. Uh, the American tree sparrow in the winter. And nothing says winter more than a dark-eyed junco on a Norway spruce with snow on the branches. I mean, that was that's just a great shot. And, one, and once again, you can see it was snowing outside. So I just love taking photographs when uh, we've got some weather conditions out there. Had a house wren land on it. Um, had a palm warbler land on it, early morning, light in the background of the woods. Now when this guy landed on it, everybody else left. They all left, so um, kind of he doesn't go come by too often, fortunately, but it's, he's always nice to see. Uh, I'm going to talk just a second about processing because that's like a whole another lecture, but I do process all of my photographs because I want to do something with the saturation, brightness, contrast cropping, all of those things to take just what might be a little bit dull and just make it pop a little bit more. So processing is, is, is very important to learn. You should really not let your camera process it. You should process it yourself if you want to really get an artistic shot here. You know, this is the original shot and I mean, it just doesn't say anything, but by, by rotating it a little bit, and by brightening it up, using a little bit of vignette in, on the borders there, it just it makes a, an artistic shot. Uh, and occasionally, you know, I really want to focus on the bird and I don't want things to distract from it. So occasionally if I have a, a what I think is a nice shot, if I've got some branches that are just in the way, I will take the time to remove those branches in post-processing. A lot of people do branch removal. Um, as long as you're, I don't add anything, I just take things away and it just, it, you know, like I say, the bird is the star of the show and that's what I want to want to show. Now here, I learned from my missed shots. I don't, anybody ID this bird? I don't think so. But the next shot, you'll be able to, you might be able to ID. This is my, the next shot where I tried to get the same bird. Yeah. No. Okay, anyway, I finally learned to get the shot that I wanted and that was it. So that's what I was going after and uh, watching this northern flicker in there. And these are tough shots to get, but you've got to work and work and work, practice, 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 practice. Uh, I'm going to end this lecture with my cardinal rule. My cardinal rule is you can never take too many photos of cardinals. <laughs> They're gorgeous. They're beautiful birds. They're very cooperative. You give them a couple of sunflower seeds. They do funny things. The wind hits them. Um, they're, they look great in the snow. Um, they look great in the woods. I mean, they're just fan You just never can take too many shots. You never can have too many cardinals. Well, unless you do what I did, and I went into a, an AI generating program, and I said, I typed in 20 cardinals in a stream in the woods, and it gave me that. So watch out for AI, because it's, it's crazy, crazy what it does out there. Anyway, I want to thank you for your attention. Have fun. Get out there, take photographs, and uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions if you have any. And if you need to contact me, there's some contact info for you. Thank you very much. Yes. For your setup shots, where, where are you in those? Are you sitting in a chair in your yard? Or? Uh, sometimes I'm sitting in a chair. Sometimes I, I have a sliding patio door, so I'm kind of just inside the house with my lens sticking out of the patio door. Uh, I have thought about getting a blind to use, but pretty much I'm far enough away the birds don't care that much that I'm there. So. Yeah, that's on. That's on my. I know. Yeah. That's such a great. Yeah, thing. yeah. I've been getting taking more video now than photos, just because I can. I guess it's uh, trying to, so it's fun. So yes. What do you post process with? What's your program? My program of choice uh, for a number of years now is called Affinity Photo, and the reason I like it is because it's not a a subscription photo. You just pay for it once. It's not, actually not that expensive, and it has almost all the features that. Photoshop has. 
Um, and I've just gotten so used to it. Now I do use it with some, some filters. I use uh, some Topaz denoise uh, plugins so that I can take out noise if I shoot at a real high ISO and I, I have a lot of noise in there. Um, but that's uh, Affinity Photo is my processing program. Yes? How many hours a week do you spend with photography? <sighs> Every day. Yeah, I mean, you know, one thing is nice, I'm, I'm retired, but I do have, you know, grandkids, so I do try to spend a lot of time with them too. But uh, I try to get out, that's the nice thing about getting out early, I can spend a couple of hours easily uh, out there, and then plus with my backyard, I can intermittently, you know, do things out in the backyard. So it, it just, it all depends. I mean, I've been out, I've gone out where I've been out for six, eight hours, and I've been out sometimes where I'm just out there for an hour. So it just, it just depends as much as I can, though. Yes? Your photos, you had your camera settings on, yes. on there. How do you keep track of that with each photo? Uh, that's built into what's called the metadata. And it's on each photograph. So the processing program, if you say show EXIF data, which is what it's called, it will show all of those uh, uh, settings. So, yep. Yes? Do you spend more time taking photographs or processing? It's almost 50-50. I mean, seriously, I, if I have a photo that I just love, I could spend an hour working on that one photo. And then sometimes I get so wrapped up with it, I have to put it aside for a while, and then I come back to it and I go, oh, what did I do to that photo? You know, because I just over-processed it or something. So then I have to kind of cut back. And I try to scale back with it because uh, I don't want to do too much, but I, I just, I, I'm going for that artistic, that work of art. But yeah, processing is, is huge. That is the um, Nikon 500 PF lens. It's a 500 millimeter uh, lens, actually made for the, the older model Nikon that I'm using on the newer one with a, an adapter. They've come out with a 600 for the newer one, but it works fine with the adapter and I'm, I'm happy with it. It's an incredible lens. I mean, anyone who uses a, a zoom lens and then goes to using just a single focal length prime lens will see a difference in quality. It's just, you. you can't quite uh, beat it, so. All right, thanks so much.